Good morning. Oh, wait. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ellen Hororic. I am the worship pastor at the Salida Vineyard down the canyon. Alicia asked me some weeks ago to come and fill in and help out. And I also know Matt and Teresa a little bit as well from being worship pastors and um, directors. We've connected before. So I'm here to come and bring you some carrion food. <laughs> um, I am excited. Um, to be able to worship with more of the family of God together with you. It's always fun to get another flavor of what the Spirit is doing over here, and yet he, God is at to all of the same kinds of things everywhere in the world and in every church. And, um, and I'm just excited that we serve such a big God. Amen? I invite you to stand with me, and we'll, we'll begin in worship. <laughs> Spirit, we invite you here. Come and be at rest in this place and to rest on us. We welcome you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we just open our hearts and minds to worship you. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on
from beyond the unknown. And I pray that today that we would hear your voice, whether it's for the first time or for the hundredth time, calling to us. Help us just to respond yet again today, to say yes to you, to grow in trust with you. We trust you, God. You are so good to us. You have the best in mind for us. We love you, Lord, and we love to worship you. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining me in worship. I think we're going to have some announcements here. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Any kids that want to be dismissed for downstairs going having fun down there, <laughs> are dismissed. <laughs> it's so nice to see some faces I haven't seen in a while and new faces. I'm usually doing Bible study uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30. So my name's Sharon, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I get to do announcements. Um, any new guests, which to me, you're all, a lot of you are new because I don't come on Saturdays. <laughs> so um, there's gifts that we have on the back tables you're welcome to grab one of those on your way out. Um, the School of Extraordinary, I am always worried I'm gonna mess that name up. <laughs> Ministry is currently accepting applications. Um, and there's also some um, sign-up sheets in the back tables. There's one over there and there's one over there for local activities. And I think there might be a couple of sign-ups um, for Bible studies as well. Um, and then we also have the announcements and the scripture for our, our sermons on the Bible app under events. Um, and I think that's it. We have a short list today. So <laughs> I'll pray for the offering. Um, Father God, thank you so much for all of these amazing people that came out to hear your worship, to come fellowship, and to be together. We lift up the offering to you and you, as you kept speaking to me from the second song of never ending, your love is never ending. And our offering is just a small token of our love to you 
because we know that you can do amazing things with it. We bless it. We help it um, to go as far as you possibly can make it go, which is beyond any of our imaginations. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. We have um, offering boxes in the back. Um, you can do online, mail it, um, all kinds of different things. <laughs> and now I get to announce um, Jeff Mueller is our speaker tonight. So if you would welcome Ooh. Jeff, yeah. he's awesome. Thank you. Check, 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 check. Yeah, would you guys do another round of applause real quick? Thanks, I'm glad that we got that out of the way. You know, sometimes after I talk, people don't clap. And so I was sort of thinking that maybe if you clap now, that that would sort of check that box and, and, and we would do it, so that's good. Can you hear me okay? Everybody's, everybody's all good? Um, a couple of quick things. I am not a pastor. I'm not a clergy. I'm not an ordained person. So I don't want you to be confused about the message that I'm going to try to share with you or some information I'm going to try to share with you uh, as being particularly holy or well-grounded. I'm just a, a sinner doing a, a task. Um, Greg and Alicia asked me to do a sermon while they were gone. It's not really a sermon, it's a bit more of a talk. And so um, it just ha happens to be that something I'm going to try to do. The other thing I really don't know for sure is I don't know how long uh, the talk is going to last. So um, here's the deal. If you guys get done before I do, then it's, it would be okay just to go ahead and leave and, and, and just wave or something like that. And Eventually, I'll get the, the hint, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to move along. Uh, the, the talk has to be, it's sort of ever-changing, and I don't want to spoil the, the, the subject, but um, while I was listening to Oceans, and, and I'm an old music guy, so I, I find that um, music is prayer. Amen? And so, Holy Spirit, come. Uh, we welcome you into this place. Uh, we have to be vessels prepared to hear a message, um, to pray that it resonates with somebody and that it will touch someone's uh, life. But I, I couldn't help but um, feel some of the things that I might comment about were changing as I was hearing Oceans. I, I love that song, but I was thinking of troubled waters and stuff, and maybe I'll try to tie that together as it comes into the talk. So give me a slide or something, if you have one. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> does anybody remember the movie Fatal Attraction? Okay, and for those of you who remember or, or you uh, don't remember, go to the next page. Slide, yeah. So Michael Douglas, this is a 1987 movie. Uh, it's a thriller. And, and Michael Douglas has a weekend of affair with, with Glenn Close. And he, I'm not condoning affairs, by the way, but he thinks it's going to be a pretty casual thing. So, boom, 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 it's over. His wife is out of town. Um, I'm expecting that Monday things are going to be fine and be right back to where they were. That's not how the movie goes, for those of you who have seen it. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's only a thriller because she becomes preoccupied with him, and she wants this relationship to, to continue. And so the fatal attraction is her attraction to him and how it becomes an obsession. And, and, and it goes into all kinds of craziness and, and stabbings and different things that are not important. But what, <laughs> what is important is that sometimes you get this attraction totally changed what was happening in their lives. Right? Whatever they were doing on Friday, by Monday, those things had all taken second position, and, and they were now 100% focused. He's trying to figure out his wife doesn't know that it happened yet. She soon finds out. But Glenn Close is now not willing to back off, and so pretty soon the intensity of this attraction goes into all kinds of crazy places. What does that have to do with anything here? 
Well, we'll go to the next thing. So the title of my talk is Fatal Distraction. And Greg and Alicia asked me, I'm a, I'm a money guy for, for those who either do or don't know. So I look after money, I take care of things, I do a bunch of financial kinds of stuff. And so I've taught a lot of classes on literacy and, and other things. And she, Alicia, uh, was, was somewhat concerned and maybe that we could talk about the fact that people are really stressing right now for the price of gas and utility of food. Has anybody noticed that those things are getting expensive and inflation is rampant and it's totally turning our financial lives? Maybe some of you are rich. Would you, would you raise your hand if you're <laughs> rich? Maybe, maybe you're not rich, and I don't necessarily mean that you're poor, but and I'm not being unsensitive to the fact that people can be struggling. And that's what um, Alicia sort of initially wanted me to talk about, was could I coach you through some ideas to help you through these difficult times of, of inflation and financial woe, woe, woes. So, but God gave me this different thing, uh, as he sometimes does, and, and I, I, I don't always get enlightened like that, but in the midst of thinking about the money and thinking about the burden that each of us have as we're trying to raise funds for a church or our budget doesn't work or our gas is in trouble, and it does seem a little bit like every time we turn, we're struggling a, a little bit with the money side of it. Um, but what became clear to me is that our eye is on the wrong ball and that the, the stress that we're feeling about the money is keeping us from pursuing God's purpose for our lives. So give me another slide. So <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a kind of a PowerPoint guy. I didn't want to blow up everything I... I usually have these things sliding in from left and right and stuff so that you don't read the second one and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one before we get through with the first one. But the point ends up being that the world's events and the tests that are distracting us from God's purpose in life, that's what's scaring me. The danger is that we become focused on our financial burdens or our challenges ahead of what God's purpose is. I, no different than in fatal attraction when all of a sudden these people's lives completely turned and went into a different direction, totally pressed into the attraction that was developed right or wrong, or wrong, obviously, but this distraction is what's bothering me. This is the distraction that I think should be bothering you. It's probably the distraction I think that's bothering God, is that we are not pursuing him in a way that... that is supposed to maybe be clearing the path that we're on because we're distracted on the things that occupy us every day. We already go to work, eight to five, we have kids, we have wives, we have husbands, we have distractions. And Satan is great for confusing us and the distraction from, is, is and distracting us from what is important. So he has to be, you know, just excited as heck uh, with the idea that we're not focused on the Great Commission. We're not even remotely interested at the moment in why are we here. And, and I did a talk a while back that talked about, a little bit about why are we here and what's our purpose. Uh, and so we don't want to relive that. But the world asks you who you are. And then if you don't answer, then the world tells you who you are. And the same thing is true with our money, and we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a couple seconds. But... Um, when we take charge of something, then we're telling the world who we are. Otherwise, the world's going to move us in a bunch of other distract in, in another, some other places. There is some perspective that I think is helpful. You can give me a little bit another one. Uh, I found it fascinating. Ninety countries have higher gas prices than we do, and less than ten percent of the people even have a car. So. Show me, if you're an adult, who, who does not have a car? Okay, we've got one, two, three. So we, we have, but, okay, that wasn't as much fun as I hoped. How many people have a car? Okay, so what you start to see is it's, 
we think in our little world that we have our dilemmas, and I'm not suggesting we don't, but we sometimes have to have a perspective of what someone else does. 76% of the people think that saving money has to eliminate something that brings them joy, and 57% of the people uh, don't want to budget, and Gen X, uh, Gen Z people believe it's um, important to spend money on things that they make that are happy. Uh, I don't remember where I was going to insert this piece, but I'm going to just insert it now because it, I remembered it, which is important. Uh, Connie and I, on our 50th wedding anniversary, went to Africa on a photo safari. And we met people in Tanzania, a, a town called Arusha, of 2 million people, 50% of whom are unemployed. And so every other person has no job. And so we met Matthias and Nima and their family, and, and they're struggling. Their, their principal uh, goal is to educate their kids in private education, because that's where you learn English and, and different things, and that accelerates them through the curve. Uh, so we've decided to sort of help that, but that's not what's important. What's important is that one they're nine hours ahead of us, and one day I'm getting a WhatsApp. If you know what that is, it's like a text, but it's WhatsApp. I'm getting a WhatsApp from him, and I'm going, Matthias, what are you doing at four in the morning over there? And he said, well, you know we don't have any running water. I hope all of us pretty much have running water. And he said, um, it hasn't rained a lot lately, so the cisterns that we share in our little group of houses um, don't have water. So I have to go out early in the morning to fetch water. But for a family of four. But this was a good day because I was able to fetch 28 gallons of water to serve his family of four. While I'm listening to my sprinkler system running in the background, watering our grass, right? Sometimes we need to fly up to 30,000 feet or something in a helicopter and kind of look down to get a perspective of how crazy fortunate we are. If you can change to the next slide. Popular things that I see in my, my world are that we want to blame somebody for the problem. Um, and blaming, of course, doesn't solve anything, but we want to blame the wealthy, the Democrats, the, the Republicans, somebody, our bosses, the company, the owners. Uh, my problem can't possibly be m something I have anything to do with. It, it had to be forced on me by someone else. But the reality is we're going to have to look in the mirror and address the reality that's in your life. That is, if it's not going to be, a if it's ever going to be to the point that it's not a distraction for you. So, you're really responsible for your own joy and you must develop self-control in yourself and in your family unit. Connie and I do some devotions and we're good friends, not good friends, we're friends with Joyce Meyer who's a, a preacher on television and she has a great devotional. Uh, usually what happens when I find if I'm doing a talk, pieces of paper show up in certain ways or through a devotion or through a song that sort of say, oh dude, this is like... Uh, I, I think God's trying to tell me something, but when we're unhappy, we use, she says, you have to be responsible for your own joy. When we're unhappy, we usually blame it on somebody or someone else. It rarely occurs to us that we must be responsible for our own joy, but it's indeed what we have to do. Blaming others for our problems only puts off the inevitable because the blame doesn't solve the problem. Sooner or later, we have to take responsibility for our lives if we want to enjoy our lives. So life is not fair. You're going to have to get over it. I told, um, uh, so I'm a financial guy, I told you, I, I give advice to people. And uh, one of the things that's important in my line of work is to tell truth and to tell people what they have to hear, which is not always what they want to hear. So when I was talking to Alicia, I said, I, I'm happy to talk because it, 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 it sort of suits me okay. I said, but there's going to have to be meat and potatoes because somebody out here needs to know that 
their financial woe or the struggle is not someone else's fault, particularly. It probably won't be solved by someone else and that the power to solve it is within you. They're just, I, I stand in front of the mirror and wait for someone to respond, right? And the only person I see in the mirror is me. And I mean, I keep thinking, where is it? Why is it? Why, why? And, and the response is, it's like having a board meeting in the mirror. There's only, there's nobody there but, but yourself. So life does consist of, of choices and how you respond will be liberating and empowering. We'll flip to another one. Um, this, is, this is my meat and potato stuff kind of for you because I told Alicia I would try to leave you with some takeaways. And um, the way we think, the way Connie and I think, and, and so this is not intended to be a lecture, I, this is the way Connie and I live. And so I'm just sharing with you how we live and the kinds of things that, that, that we talk about. So we are believers in prayer before we do anything. So whether you're tithing or whether you're working on money or those kinds of things, we have to invite the Holy Spirit into that, okay? Because for him to engage in us and enlighten us, if you read the book of Proverbs, um, which I had to do, do you remember Alex Ackerman? Anybody remember Alex? Yeah. So he and I did this video thing on, on, on Proverbs, and I didn't know a heck of a lot about Proverbs. I mean, I did, but I didn't. But I had to bone up on it to do this thing, and, and there's an incredible amount of wisdom in, in, in Proverbs, and so the point ends up being when you invite the Holy Spirit in and, and you get your true north and you, and you begin to be prepared for you to be in his presence and you invite him into uh, your process, how many are single compared to married? How many are single? Okay, yeah. And so it's a little trickier sometimes there, but not so much. We talk about a priority pyramid, and we talk about how you would do a priority pyramid. Ben and Ellen, you would do a priority pyramid, not together, because you criticize it. I mean, we, we, we do. So we do the priority pyramid apart, and then we come together to look at it. That's how it works. And you could do that yourself as a single person, but in marriage... Our priorities are slightly different, but until you develop the priority pyramid and assess the size of the pieces of your pie on how you're going to spend your money. Tim, what's important to you might be completely different than what's important to you. Maybe not, but they may fit on different places in the, in the pyramid, and so you have to negotiate to that because when you build your pie of how you're going to make, if you make $2,000 a month or whatever, and you're going to split up the pie into the categories, they have to be split based on priority and needs versus wants and, you know, that sort of thing. You have to have some wedges because this day and age, when in the pie, the amount you allocate to, to groceries or to gas, those are, without you trying, they are swelling in terms of how much of your pie they take, right? Is that happening? So when you can, you can complain about it, but it doesn't make any difference. The fact is when food occupies a greater section or gas does, you're going to have to look at what you can do in the other pieces because there is nobody to look to other than yourself. Sometimes you have to reduce your wants so you can focus on your needs. You have to find less, a way to spend less regardless of the circumstances. Uh, we have a, a friend that we know and they had a bunch of credit card debt and he had to quit smoking. I was a smoker until I was just before I was 30 and, and um, cartons of cigarettes used to be about $10 for like a carton. And uh, now it's like $10 a pack or something. And the line at Starbucks is still down the street. And so I know all the suffering people, uh, but they, they still prioritize something. And I can't tell you what your personal thing is, and I am certainly not trying to make light of the fact that each of you have something that's causing you to struggle. 
but until you are empowered to take ownership of it, you will be distracted from God's purpose for your life. So, uh, I already told you the debt, that's, debt's a red light, that's no good. Um, does everybody know Rick Warren who wrote Purpose Driven Life, you know, most popular book other than the Bible in the history of the world? Um, as soon as I found out I was doing this, what is his topic for the month? His topic is on financial fitness. And so he says, you must tell your money where it will go. Otherwise, it will just go. And so uh, you guys are like a couple, right? You know, you're holding hands, you look like a couple. And so I don't know what you're like. I don't mean to embarrass you, but at some point, Connie and I know that if we just kick the car in gear and are heading down the road, we spend money and things happen and, and it's based on going to the mall or temptation or I don't, I don't know all the things that happen. Certain things are based on need, okay? And, and so you have to pay the, your light bill and, and all that stuff. But at any rate, he says, this is Rick Warren, and again, it's coming from Proverbs, plan carefully and you'll have plenty. If you act too quickly, you'll never have enough. I can't tell you in the years I've been doing financial things, I'm a CPA as well, for 50 years almost. And I can't tell you the number of people who've said, if I could make more, then it would be fine. And the answer is, you will never make enough for it to be fine. If you can't live on less than you make now, you will never live on less than you make ever. So financial principles, behaviors have to be done at the core. One step is is uh, in reaching those goals is to plan your spending. Now, some people call that budgeting, and I'm not going to beat up budgeting. I mean, you, this is not supposed to be one of those things that make you go out of here after the talk and throw up somewhere. But um, <laughs> budgeting, in a macro sense at least, is your way of specifically telling your money where it needs to go. I'm going to tell you again. You do that at, in prayer as a family unit at the first of the month or whatever you're doing, and you mandate, because you are a steward over the money, you mandate where the money is going to go because until you get a grip on that, we have this problem. It's based on how you spend what you make. Yeah, I guess if we could all make more, that's fine. I don't really know what some of these football players do that make a hundred million dollars or something like that. I, maybe they have a budget, maybe they don't need one, but uh, it sure seems to me that, that uh, if you had more, it would work. But I, I'm just here to tell you that most people who get a pay raise or, or have more, it, it ends up not being necessarily enough. Okay, so we'll go again. Can I have another slide? Okay, so um, Connie and I spent some time originally when we were doing this sort of thing saying we will spend less. We will do this or that in a pretty general way. And our, and our financial things never really worked because we weren't specific. And so one of the key takeaways for you is that you have to have specific goals to combat this economy. Now you can say, well, the economy is eventually going to get better and gas will go down and interest rates will come back down and we can buy houses and lumber and blah, 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 blah and then cigarettes. Well, we, we all can hope that things will come down to fit the budget we had before. But the fact of the matter is you're either going to have to fix it now or you're going to have credit card debt and then you're not going to know exactly what to do. So you do have to be specific that I, and I can't, I don't know what would be in each of your lives, but you have to sit back and say, and this one guy, he quit smoking, but we have two cars, we need one car. We need a used car instead of a, a new car. We need to take fewer trips to the mall and fewer trips to this. Somebody has to be specific. We're going to go shop for groceries on Monday of each week. We're just not going to randomly drive down there and burn up gas and, and do things all the time. So you 
you have to figure out in your wedges and your piece of the pie what it is exactly that you need to specifically address to fit you. First, I believe you have to have a heart of gratefulness and thanksgiving. So in addition to praying and inviting the Holy Spirit into your life, um, we have to be thankful and grateful for what we have. Um, and we have to become givers. There's a huge, I didn't want to get real scriptural on you because I'm like not a pastor. I'm just kind of this lay guy trying to sh tell you a story. But I can tell you when you reach out to other people because you have a heart of thanksgiving and gratefulness and you give something to somebody else, however little it is, it is your way of, of planting a seed of prosperity in your own life. Not only does God love generosity, and he loves it when you're radical, but he doesn't want it from your surplus. He wants it through obedience. And he wants you to be able to spot the needs of someone else that is greater than your own. Everybody, everybody knows somebody with less. Now, we fuss and stew about the people at Walmart and, and all that, and whether you're helping those people or not helping those people, but you don't, if, if, I'm not trying to be a champion for that particular thing, but if uh, Connie and I have this saying that says, if something is in front of us and it doesn't represent a hardship, we're supposed to respond. And that doesn't mean huge things. It can be time, talent, and treasure. It can be cleaning up something. It can be doing a lot of things. But when you take your mind off yourself and you start from a position of gratitude and thanksgiving perspective becomes clearer does that resonate with anybody okay saw some people crying and tears and stuff because um, you do have to remember that we're part of the most prosperous and financially blessed nation in the world and the only obstacle you face is yourself now, we have a jacked up world. Seriously, right? Um, you're either a Christian or you're not. Now, you ch go to church or you don't go to church. Now, our friend Joyce Meyer says, you know, you can be in church all day long and not be a Christian. Any different than you could be in a garage all day long and become a car. So I have to feel in this world, we have lots of people going to church that, that's not really Christians or they're selectively following certain kinds of things. So I'm not trying to, to uh, be on a soapbox. I'm, not, I'm also not trying to suggest that our world is not goofy. But if you read the newspaper as your source, source of wisdom, depression will certainly set in compared to reading the Bible or God's Word. Or You know, Connie and I have like four daily devotions we read, and I guess it's because we're thick-headed and we can't quite get it through ourselves, but um, it is important for us to see that message to, to gain perspective in the morning, otherwise we're sort of lost for the rest of the day, but remember that managing your, your distractions is a spiritual discipline, and that you have to be a good steward of your time, talent, and treasure if you're pursuing God's purpose. Rick Warren says, if you want God, to use you in great ways, you need focus. The more focused you are, the more effective you'll be, and the more God will use you. But if you focus your time on a few key goal, goals, you can make a powerful impact. That's what we were saying a minute ago, is you focus on a few things. Um, yeah, you really never know if you've got a completed goal to, until you do that. The discipline thing I thought was kind of fun... Um, where managing your money is a spiritual discipline. If you, if you, your spouse, or yourself would approach your financial situation, gas, kids, expenses, as a spiritual discipline, you've invited the Holy Spirit in and you come at it with a heart of gratefulness and thanksgiving, I think... That's what the rich man was looking for when he gave the talents to the three people. Remember the story where they, he gave the three out and somebody made some and somebody didn't and somebody buried some and all that. What God was really trying to do there 
was to have you be a steward, a manager of the money. You, you do know that nothing you have is yours. Is that, is that, I hope that's not the first time you ever heard that. We can't take it with us. Um, he's provided it for us. We'll argue it's not enough, but he's provided it for us, and he's expecting you as a spiritual discipline to manage the money that he's given to you through the efforts you're making as a good steward. The guy who buried it, of course, was not a great steward. So, so what distraction? Super, thanks for your help back there, guys. Robin. If you don't get your life's distractions under control, you run, the, you run the danger that your distraction might keep you from seeking and following God's purpose in your life. I, I just, it's, I have to admit to you when this revelation came to me, I, I like to talk about money, I do it all the time, but when it became clear to me that this money thing we are all talking about could be a distraction, I can't tell you how many times we're at lunch or dinner or out with friends and we're talking about money. The, or, or rather the lack of money, and, and, the comp, and I'm going, when are we going to talk about your purpose for Jesus? I mean, are you allocating any near much of that time? You have gifts and talents, each of you, that were intended to be used in the kingdom for the kingdom purpose. <laughs> I, was, I was fearful. I thought it if you miss a, a cigarette and a latte or a gallon of gas, it might seem bad at the, the moment, but I said, wait till you meet God face to face and tell him you were distracted and he didn't ever get around to the Great Commission. I'm just thinking that would so suck. I, I just, I, I, uh, I know today we're worried about the cigarette and the latte and, and the other kinds of things, and you're going you're gonna to leave here walking out the door uh, with the same financial pressures or irritations or, or anxiety that you had when you came in. But if you don't, if you don't take a spin and, um, you know, kind of like go back into why are you here and what was God's purpose, you know, that whole Psalm 139 thing, the whole, he was there when you were born, when he knit you. Is there some surprise to you that he has a purpose for you? And then I, don't, I didn't want to be corny, but about the whole, what's the story about the robins and how better the robins and how better he'll provide for you than the, I never figured that one out exactly, but I, I do know they fly around and there's food there or something. And, and, and there is something that we're, we're supposed to enjoy, I guess, because of that. But um, I was reminded that when Peter was asked to get out of the boat and walk towards Jesus. That he, he had to have some element of trust that doing something completely foreign like walking on the water was going to be okay because he, he saw Jesus. He was in connection with Jesus at that moment. And if you remember the story, the moment he began to wonder why he was walking on the water and how all of a sudden like, can't walk on the water, right? He took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink, right? And then he began to get scared. Um, so that's what would reminded me. I didn't know if you had sheet music or you all on an iPad. Is it sheet music or is it iPad? Yeah. So in oceans, um, trust. The waves of life will come your way. But the song reminds us, because the song is a prayer, the song reminds us that we look past the waves, trusting in our Savior. There's um, one more goodie from, from uh, Rick Warren. He says, choose faith over fear in your finances. When you try to do things God's way, faith, or sorry, fear often emerges. Satan will try to get you to ignore the principles for your money management 
by making you afraid of failure or making you doubt your ability to be a good steward of God's money. But if you're going to be successful in pursuing his purpose for your life, you have to move against your fear. You have to do the very, very thing that fears you first. Like tithes first. And everything else fits, right? When you move forward in faith and you follow God's guidelines for financial peace, you will experience God's blessings and even more resources and responsibility. It's a corny, it's a corny thing to, for me to get my arms around that when we give away, we'll get more, or when, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but I think Scripture is pretty clear about whose money it is and to those who trust much is given. And so you may never think that you have enough to do what you need to do, but you will always have enough. The sacrifice that you make is at the foot of the cross, right? So you may think I can only drive one car instead of two and I have to have a used one instead of a new one and I can't have a latte every day. I can only have it on Fridays and I can't drive to the store and better damn not sure go to, oh, that's not, better not go to Walmart randomly because I will buy something. You must put those sacrifices at the foot of the cross because that's where you're trying to gain clarity and wisdom and worship. Worship happens when you prioritize the money. So you embrace these challenges and then you don't worry because worry is the opposite of faith. And uh, I saw this, this quote that had nothing to do with the scripture or anything, but it, it said, and remember that you can't wait for everything to be okay to be happy. This journey is, uh, is not a journey about happiness to work on money and that sort of stuff. You must get it under control and get it behind you so that you're prepared to go to the altar and ask for God's purpose in your life, right? So um, I wanted to end in kind of a prayer that had to do with um, a, a song that Ecclesia, a group that I know in Denver, used to sing. And it, it had to do, we'll invite you up if, you want prayer over something that's happening in your life or in your money, but um, this song was, Lord, I'm sorry for the times I forget who you are in my life. And in my moments of distraction, bring my heart back to you. Amen? And the wonderful Ellen and Ben are going to do the song In Your Presence, and, and it's, um, it's where you will find peace and clarity. There's no ironic thing you come across in devotions or, or things you read or listen to if you're studying scripture. Those words will come to you that will offer you encouragement to take whatever your distraction is. And maybe I was asked to talk about money, but it could be almost anything, right? People are distracted. They need to name it. They need to claim it, and they need to turn their hearts back to God to find his purpose for our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Here, now, go. Oh. Yeah, sorry, so thanks. The, the applause should be for the worship team, who is awesome. If you are inclined and you, you need to come forward and you want to have the prayer team pray over finances or whatever the distraction is in your life, it may not be finances, but uh, come and seek prayer. Uh, seek the presence of the Holy Spirit as, as the song is so fitting.
yeah, and I think you are welcome to stay and get prayer if that's still something you need, but otherwise, go and be blessed, and thank you so much for just sharing in the fellowship of Jesus today with me.